Hello everyone, this is an introduction to oxidation reduction reactions. We'll be using redox um, concepts kind of throughout the course and culminating in a chapter towards the end of the course in electrochemistry where it's really important, but we'll use these ideas and discuss this kind of throughout the time. Um, kind of the gist here is that redox reactions, uh, electrons are transferred from one thing to another, one substance to another, electrons are moving many reactions are redox reactions just burning as you can see in the examples on this uh, burning octane combusting it with oxygen um, some reactions are not but the reactions that are electrons are being transferred the key to it when we get to electrochemistry is if you can capture those electrons you have yourself a battery um, and that is very valuable obviously all batteries run off of um, some sort of chemical reaction where the electrons are moving, including your phone batteries. Um, they naturally go in one direction when they're being used, and then when you charge them up, you are um, putting electricity into them to push them back where they came from. And you can do that over and over again. Uh, similar to in college chemistry when we talked about the photoelectric effect and the electrons that could be kicked off of an of a substance when hit with certain frequency of light, uh, if they're just kicked off, then those electrons go into the air and ionize something somewhere. But if you can capture those electrons, you have um, electricity. If the electrons can be uh, put through a wire, you have a circuit. So um, electrons can be very valuable if you use them um, correct way from a chemical reaction or photo um, <clears throat> electric effect standpoint. So this is kind of just our intro to how um, oxidation reduction works uh, because you haven't really seen it before in college chemistry. So um, here's a couple examples. Many of them are um, many are redox reactions. Some are not. Um, here's an example of a redox reaction. I'm going to assign oxidation numbers even though I haven't talked to you about the uh, um, how to assign them quite yet. I'll just kind of start talking about that. Um, if you have a free element, hydrogen, or any element that will have an oxidation state or an oxidation number of zero, essentially oxidation uh, state is explaining uh, the distribution of electrons rather than just a partial negative or partial positive, kind of assigning a number to that value. Uh, once it forms a compound here, hydrogen would be a plus one, oxygen a minus two. And we'll talk about the rules of where that's coming from in a tiny bit. But what this would mean then just like when we in college chem diagrammed water like this and we said oxygen's a partial negative and this is a partial positive this assigns a value to that distribution of the electrons we know that there's not a, a ionic bond here it's not a true negative or positive but this negative 2 is showing giving a value to the idea of how much the electrons are around that atom and there are certain rules that we will follow to figure this out. The hydrogen is always a plus one when it's in a compound. Oxygen is always a minus two. Um, fluorine will always be a minus one. There are some small um, exceptions to that, but we are not going to worry about that in this class. Same type of example here, where we have oxidation numbers changing from left to right. So uh, sodium is a zero, chlorine is a zero because they're in their elemental state. Once they become this, there's a plus one and a minus one. Um, so it can be used for ionic compounds too, and you already know that sodium can lose its electrons to chlorine to make this product. You know that's how it works. Um, when we talk about it in college chem, uh, there's a transfer of electrons. But when you have ionic substances, the oxidation state, if it's a monatomic ion like this, it's just going to be the charge that it would be if it's an ion. Um, oxidation numbers are used a little bit more in um, molecules and polyatomic ions uh, typically, but you definitely can apply to any type of substance. So here you can kind of see a little bit more. Electron transfer is not complete um, to be an oxidation reduction, just uh, uneven sharing. So in the case of hydrogen and chlorine, there's no uneven sharing at all, but once we get something like HCl, it would be uneven and we'd assign a value to that uneven sharing and where the electrons truly are. So here's a, here's a memory device. Um, some people use oil rig as a memory device as far as what it means to be oxidized or reduced. <clears throat> so if a substance loses electrons during the process of a chemical reaction, that is 
considered to be an oxidized substance, loses electrons. So it loses electrons, oxidized. If it gains electrons, it is reduced. So we follow the substance. So for instance, this is a zero. Here it's a plus one. Um, to go to a more positive value, must have lost an electron. Uh, here this is a zero, this is a minus one. To go more negative value, must have gained an electron. So that's why sodium would be oxidized and chlorine reduced. Um, so oxidation state, oxidation number are the same thing. So even though they look like oxidate or like ion charges, they really are not. Like it says here, they're imaginary charges. Um, ion charges are, are real. So what's meant by that is so sodium is a plus one because it's literally lost an electron to the chlorine, which is a minus one. Um, so those are real charges when we're talking about water and the oxygen being a minus two oxidation state. It's not actually its charge of the ion. It is not an ion when it's in a molecule, but it just shows the distribution. And then we can follow where the electrons are flowing from where to where during a chemical reaction. Um, so this is a minus two and this is a plus one. Those are not actual charges. This is actually a mistake. If I was gonna do it exact, um, ion charges should have the number in front and the sign behind it. Um, officially, oxidation number, officially have the negative or positive sign in front. Not too huge of a deal either way, but that is the official how it works. So here are some rules that we're going to follow. Uh, free elements, we've kind of seen this one already, are always zero, no matter what. If you have monatomic charges, we talked about that already, they, add, they are the charges that they would be as an ion. If it's a compound, they will add up to zero. So what does that mean? So water here, as I've shown you a few times, Oxygen's a minus two, each of the hydrogens are plus one, so notice how they all add up to zero. Every compound, the oxidation numbers will all add up to zero. If we look at some more rules, if you have an ion, so here we're talking about NO3, I'll write it down here, NO3, the minus one charge, or one minus, I guess officially, um, each of the oxygens are minus two, there's three of them, so there's a minus six from the oxygens for that, What's going to happen is all the oxidation numbers together are going to equal the charge of the ion, not zero, if it's a polyatomic ion. Again, what does this mean? It means the oxygen is um, more electronegative, yes, but has the electrons around it more than the nitrogen and assigns a value to how much those electrons are around the atoms. It doesn't mean that nitrogen has a plus five charge as an ion. These are covalently bonded, but it does show where the electrons are compared to each other. Group one metals are always a charge. This goes back to if they're an ion, group two metals plus two, if they're an ion, they just have the same oxidation numbers as they would if they were an ion. Um, kind of talked about these already. These three are key. These three, knowing the Hall of Fame atoms can get you to a, knowing a lot of the other ones. Because if you know these atoms, and then you know that compounds always add up to zero and ions always add up to the charge of the ion, can be very helpful to know those three atoms. So those three atoms will drive a lot of our examples. So I'll do the first one with you, but I would like you to pause the video and try the next ones after that. So oxygen is always a minus two, that's a for sure. Uh, this is a monatomic ion, so that's a plus one. So what I like to do is just kind of think about, okay, what do they all add up to? If I asked you the oxidation number of oxygen, you'd say minus two, not minus 14, but the seven oxygens add up to minus 14. So for all of them to add up to zero, this must be a plus 12. So each chromium must be a plus six in this situation. So overall, if you had the substance, the electrons be around the oxygen the most, the chromium the least, and then potassium in between that, because this is the most positive value, the electrons be around it the least. So pause the video and try these last four on this sheet. All right, now that you're back, I'm going to go through them real quick. So CO3 minus two, um, each of these are minus two for a total of minus six. So that means this must be a plus four. So all of them added together equal minus two. Manganese oxide, um, again, the oxygen's minus two. The manganese must be a plus four because all of them together are equal zero. PCL5 actually is a rule we haven't talked about yet. We need to go through that real quick. The more electronegative atom is going to get the charge it would 
if it were an ion. So chlorine is more electronegative, that becomes a minus one. There's five of them for a minus five, so the phosphorus would have to be a plus five. And in the last one, chlorine's minus one, as it always is, and then sulfur would be a plus four. So just a few more things here about oxidation reduction before you do some more practice on your own. Uh, we've kind of talked about these things a little bit already, but if we're going to identify oxygen or here, carbon going from zero to a plus four, um, that would mean it's being oxidized. The sulfur is gaining electrons, so it's reduced. So that Leo Gosger can be a um, very helpful uh, memory device to understand how this is working. Also, the things that causes the reduction in a uh, reaction is called the reducing agents. So here, the sodium is being oxidized, so it's causing the reduction of Cl2. So that's why sodium is be called the reducing agent. All right, a little bit more here. One more example for you to try and give it a whirl before you do more problems beyond this. So press pause and try right now. You want to put the oxidation numbers of all of them and then try to figure out what's being reduced and what's the oxidizing agent, what's the reducing agent. Press pause and try it and come back. And here we go. I'm going to go through it real quick. This is a zero because it's a free element. This is a plus one. This is a minus one. So hydrogen is always a plus one in a compound. This is a plus two because it's this charge in this ionic compound. Each of these are minus one. This is a zero. So look at what's changing. The hydrogen's going from a plus one to a zero. That means it's gaining electrons. So that means that hydrogen is being reduced. It is being reduced. What is being oxidized? Well, in this situation, the zinc is going from zero to a plus two. That means it's losing electrons. So that means it is being oxidized. Oxidized, well, I spelled that wrong. <clears throat> now, what about the oxidizing agent? Well, the thing that's being reduced is the hydrogen, but this compound is considered the oxidizing agent. And the reducing agent would be the zinc, because even though it's being oxidized, it is causing the reduction. It is causing the hydrogen to be reduced to gain those electrons. So this would be the um, reducing agent. So that's an intro to redox reactions. Um, go ahead and practice the problems that have been assigned.